Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In our gospel lesson, we heard once again that on the evening of which Christ arose, he appeared to his disciples. They are in a room that's locked out of fear. They had heard the testimony of the women who had gone to the tomb. Peter and John had even ran to the tomb and checked it out and found it empty as well. And yet in spite of this, they are afraid. The doors are locked for fear of the Jews. Because the Jews who crucified their Lord, who came after him, now that he is gone from the tomb, may very well be coming for them next. But they're not only afraid of that. That's part of it. They were also afraid in their consciences. They were afraid of their sins because they had all fled from the Lord Jesus that night in which he was betrayed in Gethsemane. All had fled, fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah. Peter was bold enough to follow behind, but put himself in danger and ended up falling into sin, publicly denying Christ three times. And so, yes, they fear the Jews. They fear their threats. They fear their imagined wrath. But they also fear their own consciences. Gathered together in this room, together in their fear, Jesus comes that evening, stands in the midst of them, using his divine power, appears there in the middle of them, and says to them, Peace to you. For everything that could have been said after Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, after all of the scolding that could have taken place, why did you flee in the garden? Why didn't you believe me that I told you the Son of Man must be crucified and rise on the third day? Why do you fear the Jews who can only kill the body and not the soul? For all of the scolding that could have happened, Christ does not come to scold. He does not come in judgment. But he comes to these men troubled and burdened in their conscience and tells them, peace to you. And when he had said this, St. John writes, he showed them his hands and his side. He shows them that it's truly him. It's not a phantasm. It's not a hologram. But it is he, in fact, Jesus Christ, their Lord, the same one who was betrayed, who was crucified, and is now alive. And not only does he show them his hands and his side to prove to them that he is, in fact, alive, but he shows them these marks because they are the basis for his words that he speaks to them. They are the basis for him to say, peace to you. For it is only by the wounds of Jesus that anyone has peace. Isaiah had written, and we had heard on Good Friday, the chastisement for our peace was upon him. And these wounds then, they are the price of our redemption from sin. These wounds were inflicted upon Christ to earn the forgiveness of sins for all mankind including those very sins which were sinned against him by his disciples only a few days earlier. For by his stripes, they too are healed. And so he shows them those very stripes. He says to them again, peace to you. But there's more this time. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And then he breathes on them. And says, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. And in that moment, Christ gives the church a wonderful gift. For he institutes the office of the ministry. And he gives it a great and precious promise. Christ sends these men into the world as God the Father sent him. Not to atone for sins... For he had already made satisfaction for the sins of the world. That belongs to Christ alone as our one mediator. No, he sends these men into the world not to earn forgiveness, for he has done that, but to apply the forgiveness that he has earned to those who repent and believe. He says, if you forgive the sins of any, 
they are forgiven them. For that is why he sends these men out into the world to preach the gospel, to preach the remission of sins to all who repent, to bestow upon those who sorrow over their sins the blessedness of forgiveness, of absolution, of hearing the very words of Jesus spoken to them, Son, your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. He had told them that he would do this, of course. In Matthew 16, he had said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And here he fulfills that promise, giving them the keys by which they may open the gate of heaven to penitent sinners, to those who acknowledge their sins, to those who lament it in their heart and desire to amend. They are to open heaven, to forgive not in their own names, but in the name of Jesus Christ, whose death made satisfaction for all sins. There's the other side of it, though, as well. For he goes on, if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Because, as you well know, not all sinners are penitent sinners. Not all sinners acknowledge their sins. Not all sinners confess their sins to God. Many, in fact, choose to remain in their sins. Many want to enjoy their sins. Those do not want to repent. They don't want to flee to Christ for mercy. And so their sins are to be retained, bound to them on earth, and so bound in heaven, not forgiven. So the merits of Christ are not applied to them. But rather, as St. John writes, or as Jesus says in John 3, 36, the wrath of God abides on them. But again, so that they may understand the wrath of God to bring them to repentance. And for all of this, he gives them the Holy Spirit so that they may know that this ministry is not theirs, but that it is Christ's. And that it is not by their strength or their authority that they do this, but it is by his strength and authority that they may know and be confident that the Holy Spirit is present in this ministry. That means that sins truly are forgiven before God in heaven by men, just as sins are truly retained in heaven by men upon earth. For this is the ministry that God continues to graciously give his church throughout every age until the last day. This is the ministry that still, by the grace of God, abides with us here. For the apostles are dead, but their ministry that Christ instituted goes on through each and every man, through each and every generation whom he calls and ordains and places in that office. And here today, you hear once again, your sins are forgiven. Forgiven to all who truly repent and truly believe the gospel. For by those words, the gifts that Jesus earns at the cross are given directly to you. It is through those words that Jesus stands in our midst again and says, just as he said to those disciples, peace to you. But in the midst of all of the peace that Jesus gives, that he brings to these men, Thomas is not there. Nor, when the disciples tell him, does Thomas believe. In fact, he answers fairly vitriolically. He remains in his unbelief. I will not believe unless I see what I want to see. Unless I put my finger in his side as I want to do. He refuses to believe the apostles' witness. And the Lord allows him to remain in this unbelief for an entire week. And that week is for his mercy but also to test those disciples who confessed to him as well. For they were confronted already with the very harsh reality that not everyone would believe. And they were confronted with the equally harsh reality that there was nothing that they could say that would convince unbelieving Thomas to believe. For so it is today. Ministers are acutely aware of this. You are too, I'm sure. For those who are recalcitrant in their unbelief, there's no magic formula, there's no special way. If I could only say things the right way, 
then they would believe. Now there's none of that. Only Christ Jesus does that. And so, eight days later, on the next Sunday, he appears to them again, and this time Thomas is with them, and he says once again to all of them, Thomas included, peace to you. And then he turns to Thomas. Reach your finger here and look at my hands. Reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And it was so. Thomas sees and he believes. And he makes the good confession of who Jesus is, my Lord and my God. Dear saints, wouldn't it be nice if the resurrected Lord would appear to men today and convince them of his resurrection, teach them his truth? But that is not the way things work. That's not the way that Christ has chosen to work in this world. He has ascended into heaven. He works through his gospel, through mere flesh and blood men whom he has placed into his ministry as servants of the word to proclaim the law, to condemn sin, to condemn unbelief, but also to proclaim that sweet gospel of the forgiveness of sins which grants peace to the troubled conscience. And Jesus says to Thomas, that he believes simply because he sees, but blessed are they who have not seen and yet believe. Blessed are those who hear the apostles' testimony written in Scripture. Blessed are those who hear the apostles' testimony spoken through those who will follow them in the ministry. Blessed are all who hear their words, what is written and what is spoken, and believe. For John tells us that all of this was written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. All of this was written so that you may believe for the purpose of your faith. For Christ wants you to once again hear this witness and firmly believe that Christ is risen from the dead, that he is ascended into heaven, that he is seated at the hand of God the Father, ruling all things for the benefit of his church, ruling all things for the benefit of his saints, so that we may say with St. Paul, all things in this life work together for the eternal good of those who love him. He wants you. He wants all of us to continually hear his law, condemning our sins, so that we might daily repent of them. So that we might daily hear that promise of absolution spoken by your pastor as if from God himself. With that promise that he gives them in Luke 10, 16, he who hears you, hears me. He wants you to daily live in that gospel. So that having repented of sins, you may live in that joy. And that peace that he gives through Jesus. This is what makes it such a glorious ministry. Not because of the guy that fills it. But because of the spirit that Jesus breathes into it. So that by Christ working through that. Your Lord and your God. He might daily speak peace to you once again peace of conscience by which your sins are covered and your sins are forgiven peace with god through faith in christ jesus peace with god because of the wounds in his hands and his side amen christ is risen he is risen indeed hallelujah the peace of god which surpasses all understanding guard your heart through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.